Uh, I am Corey. I work for Stripe. Uh, there's actually a slide about that, so I won't, I won't talk about it anymore. Um, this talk is called Building a Cur Culture of Observability at Stripe. Um, I gave this talk at Monitorama actually in June, but I have updated it with all kinds of cool numbers. And also at Monitorama, I wasn't really talking about what we used. I, I mentioned Datadog briefly, but that wasn't really the focus of the talk. Uh, and so uh, Alon asked me if I could give this talk again and then put all the Datadog stuff back into it. So uh, I, I went over the slides last night and thought of some even cooler stuff, but I didn't want to make him update the slides. So I'm going to ask you to use your imagination. So again, Corey Watson. I go by GFAT on the internet, uh, Twitter, GitHub, all that other stuff. Uh, I joined Stripe in August of 2015, so I've been there for just over, or just getting close to a year and a half now. Um, previously, I worked at a place called Keen.io that did analytics, also a Datadog customer. And before that, I worked at Twitter, where I worked on observability there as well. Uh, I'm a generalist by trade, which means I know a whole lot about a lot of things, but very little about any of them deeply. And luckily, I have a lot of awesome people that work with me who uh, know a lot more about this stuff and can make it actually work, uh, whereas I just sort of guess. Um, but uh, so what we're talking about, again, is creating a culture of observability. Uh, you could more generally apply this to say, like, if you want to put something like Datadog into your organization, how can you pull that off? Like, it's one thing to say we're going to pay money to have Datadog and we're going to use it, but it's another thing to get all the folks that you work with to adopt and use this stuff in practice. And so I want to tell you a little story about how Stripe worked when I joined and what we've done since then. Um, when I joined, Stripe had some visibility, but not really enough. Uh, I tell a funny story that's been romanticized a bit where I say like, you know on the first day when you join a company now, they, they have you ship some code, right? They like get you in a room with all the other new hires and you write something and you deploy it. Uh, so they said, all right guys, we're gonna write this and then you're gonna deploy it to the website, you just type these commands. And so I raised my hand, I'm like, hey, so when I deploy it to the site, you know, Stripe that processes billions of dollars in credit cards, how do I make sure that I don't make it so people can't do that? Like, if I ship it and I break everything, am I gonna know? And they were like, oh, don't worry about it, it's just the site. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's, that's funny. Um, so I know I'm new and stuff, but no, tell me really, how do I know? And they're like, uh, no, don't worry about it, you just ship it. And I'm like, cool, I know what I do at Stripe now. Uh, that's not really how it went. My, my interview uh, at Stripe, they, they knew my past work and uh, they knew that this was something I could help with, so it was kind of always in the cards. Uh, but Stripe needed this. And also what they really needed was clear ownership of what observability was going to be at Stripe. Uh, there was no one that was doing any proactive work on it. It was all very reactive. Uh, we'll probably, we'll talk more about that in a moment though. Also a lot of broken windows. This is a, a, a saying that, I, an idiom I really like to use, the, the whole, when a window gets broken, then people break everything after that because no one's taking care of it. There was also a lack of confidence in the tooling, which we'll talk a little bit more about as well. Uh, a vision for the future also is pretty important. Like people need to know that it's going to get better at some point. And lastly, it was all very reactive work. Uh, these were things that like when there was an incident, we'd make a dashboard for that so that the next time it never happened, we would be sure and be able to find it. Uh, but very little re uh, proactive work was being done. So you are here today because you know that the type of stuff we're talking about is important. Um, you're here because you care about the observability of your systems and being able to react to problems and hopefully solve them in a, in a reasonable amount of time or even preventing problems from happening at all. So the question is how can we get others to agree that this is important and more importantly invest their time into doing this work? Because it's one thing again to have these tools but it's imp really important to get people to actually invest in them so that things get better instead of you just toiling away by yourself. So. Uh, there was a cool uh, thing I saw on Twitter one day where someone said, it's really hard for you to give a talk about your organization and who you are if you don't give us some facts about your organization and what you're dealing with. So uh, organizational facts about Stripe. There are about 550 people at Stripe. I assume everyone, know what Stripe, everyone knows what Stripe does. We process credit card transactions and make that easy on the internet and also other cool things like Atlas that lets you basically start a company through the internet without having the traditional hassle of all that paperwork. Uh, so 550 employees. Uh, about 100% growth in the last year. So I've been there a year and a half and I feel like I've been there a long time compared to, uh, you know, the new people come in and they think I've been there forever, which seems weird to me. Um, we have about 30 different engineering teams. Um, I don't have a lot of scope on things outside of engineering teams. We run about 230 services. Stripe is mostly a monolith, but we have a lot of supporting services that are going in the background, 
a lot of our fraud detection and stuff like that is happening in other places. Um, thousands of AWS-based hosts. We're mostly a Ruby shop. We've got some JVM stuff, especially on the data side of the house, as you can imagine, and tons of open source stuff. Like all the open source things that everybody runs, we probably run all of those too. Um, the observability team is kind of, kind of a hand-wavy number, but there are five of us that are full-time. We also have an intern that's been with us for a double internship. Uh, and then we also have one team member on loan. Uh, so depending on the day, the day of the week, sometimes we have more or less people. A and lastly, what does observability at Stripe mean? We're going to talk about what observability means. I, I enjoyed Alexi's explanation, and I have a textbook version. Uh, but observability at Stripe is uh, we are responsible for all the Datadog stuff and the integrations therein. We also work with Splunk, Sentry, PagerDuty, all the supporting libraries, like all the uh, libraries that you use in your run times to instrument your code and such, we, we work on those internally. Uh, and also the core dashboards that kind of define whether or not Stripe is working, we mostly own those and try to steward them and make sure they're in good shape. So let's say that you are here and you are adopting Datadog for the first time, or you're thinking about getting Datadog, or even really anything that's Datadog shaped. This could probably be applied to many things you might want to do in your organization, but we're here today to talk about Datadog, so let's stay there. Where does one actually begin to make a change in your organization? How does, how does one do this? Um, these are the keys that I want to kind of leave you with today. If you get nothing else, this summary slide is pretty great. Um, the first thing, I can't come up with a better way to say it, is that you genuinely have to give a shit about the people that you're working with and their happiness. Um, especially when you're in observability, like we're the people that paid you. They have every reason to not like us, right? Like we're sitting here waking them up in the middle of the night. If we ever have false positives or false negatives, there are really big consequences. And so every single day when we're working with the other engineers at Stripe, we have to really, really care about making them better, making them quicker, and making them more effective at their jobs. Also, following up on feedback, like if people come to you and they say, hey, this, this thing that you made, like it's pretty great, but it'd be really good if it did this one more thing. Or if they tell you that they hate it, following up on that and not only taking that feedback and saying, yes, thank you for that information, but then like attributing it back and then making sure that when you do the thing, in, whether it's good or bad, even if you don't do it, at least following up and saying, you know what, we just couldn't make it to that. Being accountable like that is very helpful. People understanding that you're trending toward a better future is really important. Like just sort of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, as it were, is not really a, a state anyone wants to be in. So knowing that you're trending towards some awesome thing in the future is very helpful toward keeping people's spirits up. Uh, and lastly, you can say you're doing these things, but if you're not actually measuring, like the work that we're doing is measuring you know, these little computer things that we're trying to get to do work for us. Measuring yourself, though, and the progress your team is making toward that future that you think you have coming is very important and keeps you from getting caught up in you know, sort of like spinning in place and not accomplishing anything. Um, so for us, the act of joining up with Datadog was mostly just starting completely over. We basically had to burn everything to the ground. Um, I, I, I didn't spend a lot of time on this when I spoke at Monitorama because I didn't want to tell anyone you should burn everything to the ground because that's probably bad advice. Uh, but if you're going to do this, I highly recommend you do two things first. Uh, first, spend time with the thing that you're getting rid of because your users have been spending time with the thing that you're getting rid of. They know what's good about it, and they know what's bad about it. And if you know what's good and bad about it, it's much easier for you to be an effective salesperson to get them to want to use that thing. Because if they say, man, I, I really love that you know, thing that Grafana does or something like that, you're prepared. You can say, Datadog does that too. Or you can counter with, well, yeah, but what about that one thing you don't like? Because we've solved that problem here. Um, I'm not picking on Grafana, it's a great tool. But you know, all of them are great in their own way and bad in some other ways. Also, we're going to be looking to improve the systems that you have. Datadog is not a tool that you specifically like replace everything in your organization with. It's very tightly integrated with many other services. So uh, Alexi mentioned PagerDuty earlier, or PagerDuty earlier, which is a great example. Like you don't have to get rid of that. In fact, you're going to integrate tighter with it and probably even improve it. Uh, I know that our Nagios alerts just sent like really annoying text with no actionable stuff in them. But now our, data, our, our Datadog alerts through PagerDuty send cool images that help you get a little bit of context before you actually respond to the page. Um, lastly, if there are systems you just can't improve, you can rip them out and completely replace them with Datadog. Uh, we're still in the process of getting rid of Nagios. It's sort of like a disease that we just can't completely rid ourselves of. I'm going to pause to take a drink while everybody giggles about that one. 
So we're, we're trying to get that. But more importantly, these past systems have their own failure cases or their own success cases. And um, I joke that it's kind of like archaeology, but there's like social archaeology of all the people that are working in your organization have used a lot of these tools and they have a ton of information they can help you with. And so before you embark on this great journey to replace everything with Datadog or whatever it is, uh, be sure and seek those people out because they're going to both appreciate being consulted, uh, which we'll talk more about in a moment, and then also uh, you're going to learn a ton about what not to screw up the next time you try and replace this. So why Datadog? Why should you use Datadog for this stuff? Well, I'm biased. I've been a Datadog user for many years, uh, and I quite like it. I'm also biased because of its general purpose. Um, the observability stack at Twitter was not opinionated. It was basically very similar to Datadog in that it had a simple interface for getting metrics in, and then you built dashboards and monitors effectively with a rule-based language that was whatever you wanted them to be. So since Twitter observability worked that way, and that's where I sort of earned my, uh, my wings here, then that was very appealing to me. Also the velocity, like there are all these Datadog engineers that are in here are, that are representing all the engineers and uh, other people, support people and, and, and product managers and stuff that are back still at the office, like they provide me with a ton of velocity. They make me look good because I'm just, you know, a team of like six or seven people doing this work and then there's like hundreds of people back here doing this work to make the observability stuff better for me. And that's awesome, that's a super, it's like the build versus buy thing, right? Like this is really helping us in terms of buy. But at the end of the day, I feel really great about it because even if Datadog does something I find, you know, like they didn't get that feature I wanted or they didn't add that thing that I wanted to do, almost all the tools that I ever need from them are always open source, which means I can go in and I can add that feature or I can make whatever changes I need to make it better. Lastly, uh, they're super, super friendly people. I highly encourage you to run up and talk to many of them. This will be the first time I've seen many of them in person, although I know many of them through Slack or Twitter or any of the other ways I can find to bug them and get them to make screen boards and time boards not different. Uh, the friendly and helpful staff is a huge thing for me about, uh, like I recently had a, not really a competitor, but another company whom I spent like 45 minutes on the phone to try to get them to understand that there was a CSS bug in their product. Datadog has never made me do that. They just believe me when I say that something's not right uh, and, they, and you know, they trust me as a user, which I really appreciate. So, Away from talking nice about Datadog for a moment, and let's go back to talking about how you can make change in your organization. The biggest thing I, I think, other than my, my overview slide, if we get into individual slides, is empathy and respect. This is something our industry is not generally known for. I'm sure you're all the most empathetic and respectful people in technology that are here today, but generally we have this kind of cold, uh, dismissive attitude stereotype about technology folks. Um, well, I'm here to tell you today that the people that you work with, you may think they don't care about monitoring or uptime or stability or any of the other things that wake you or them up in the middle of the night. But the truth is they're not, they're not trying to be evil, they're just busy. They've got their own responsibilities and things that have been asked of them. They've got deadlines, they've got project and product managers and just managers who are standing over them and asking them to finish up all these features that they need. And they don't have time to do all the things that you need them to do to instrument all the code points and set up all the monitors and be sure that they're not verbose and annoying. They're also pretty stressed out a lot of the times, and they're doing the best with what they have available. They have a few minutes out of the day that they can take to set up monitoring, or build that dashboard, or refine whatever that thing is that you've got in your monitoring systems. And they're doing the best that they can. But they're, they're definitely not lazy, and you being a hater about it is also extremely lazy. A lot of tech conferences, I feel like you go to them and people just stand up on stage and tell you, oh, this, it, it's very easy to be negative, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't wanna call out all tech conferences, but um, the, I highly recommend that you embrace the positives much more than the negatives when you're trying to get people to change because you catch a lot more uh, flies with sugar than with vinegar. Is that what the saying? should know that. Uh, anyway, the, the goal at the end of the day is your job in working with these tools and Datadog's job for us is to make us more powerful and more better at our jobs. So we've decided we're gonna do this replacement. We're approaching this with empathy and respect and trying to move these systems. Asking people to overcome their momentum is hard. We're asking people who come in every day and who are used to looking at certain dashboards or working a certain way to somehow now work in a different way. Knowing that you're asking people to do this up front is important. You're asking a lot of people. Um, it's like someone saying, you know, when you wake up tomorrow, you've got to suddenly start brushing your teeth with the opposite hand. Uh, you're not going to like that, and you're probably going to get toothpaste all over your shirt. I do that when I brush my teeth with my normal hand, much less the opposite hand. But yet, people still let me run their operations. I don't know why. Um, 
sometimes you just have to declare bankruptcy, technical bankruptcy on these things. We had to do that with StatsD. Uh, you know, everybody I'm sure has worked with Graphite in some capacity, um, and the whole dotted naming thing, like that doesn't translate into Datadog. Datadog doesn't support wildcards. They could technically maybe, but it would probably not be awesome for you because then you'd keep perpetuating silly Graphite names instead of using tags. Also, getting rid of this stuff has saved us a lot of ops headaches. This was a really pro, a really big pro we could throw to people. Like, we're not going to have to deal with the huge numbers of uh, graphite boxes and the gigantic stats D drop rate. Um, UDP for metrics is, is convenient, but technically not always sound. And we were dropping sometimes 50% of our metrics, and people didn't know because stats D doesn't deal well with that. Uh, lastly, we're still we're still in the process of ripping this stuff out. I don't want to stand up on stage and be like, hey, we just totally swapped it out and everything's gorgeous and beautiful. That's not true at all. Uh, graphite, stats, all those things are still running at Stripe. Um, they're just not doing anything important. Uh, in fact, someone mentioned, like I think a week ago, they're like, hey, I tried to go to Grafana and it just doesn't work anymore. And I'm like, shucks. We're not going to fix it. We're just going to leave it there because the metrics didn't work for you anyway. So we're still there. So... Uh, this is, this is probably one of the things, I didn't know that this was a thing until after I had been doing it for a little while, but there is a Japanese concept called nimawashi, in which uh, I think that the, like the, the pretty explanation of this is that if you were going to move a tree from one place to another, you dig a little bit of the dirt around the tree, go and get some of the new dirt from the new location, and put it around the roots, and give the, give the tree a chance to like taste its new environment and learn what the future is going to be like before you just rip it out of the ground rudely and stick it in a new place. This works really well with people. Uh, not necessarily digging holes and sticking them in them, that'd, that'd be weird. But uh, start small, you're a great guinea pig. Use yourself, learn these things, then start to lay a foundation by reaching out to people across your organization and just showing them what you're thinking of doing. Each one of these is a learning opportunity. Like how can you take the feedback that you're getting from them and make your next pitch even better? Um, if, you, if you actually go to Wikipedia and read about this, it even discusses that Japanese management are offended if they come to a meeting and you introduce a concept that they didn't know was going to happen. Uh, and you can imagine how that would feel even in your organization. If you show up at that all hands meeting and someone tells you some big change happened and you didn't even know, you kind of feel like a jerk. Whereas if you know, you feel a little smug, like, ah, I knew that was gonna happen already. I'm, I'm hip, people tell me stuff. Uh, but in the end, asking how you can improve is my favorite part of this. Like not only are you seeding this change, but you're also telling people that, hey, this change is coming, and can you help me pitch it to the next person? This requires a little bit of, of humility, but it's very powerful. Lastly, this is going to give you a lot of opportunities to engage discontent. You're going to find people who don't really want to change. Those people are not your enemies. They're the people you have the most to learn from. When you find people who are dismissive and difficult about what you're trying to do, those people are going to give you a ton of great information that you can apply to either the other people who are difficult or to people even who are kind of on the fence, like you'll bring them over. Uh, I, I have sort of a background in customer service, and I'll tell you that most people in a customer service situation, they probably want less to reconcile the situation than you think you have to give. You can often offer, you don't have to offer them so much. Like they don't necessarily want free, they just want a small discount just for their time as recognition. And so uh, it's usually fine to engage people that are not totally hip to this. This joke's been up here for a while, but in the end, uh, you know, there's always whiskey if you can't figure out how to uh, get them to go with you. Some people are not going to bend and uh, you'll just have to sort of move the ship of progress past them and maybe have a drink. A big way to get change in your organization is to find people who are power users. Find that person in that other team who really, really likes the idea of what you're doing with this new product or you know, Datadog or what have you. Find those people, talk to them, and say, what can I give you to make this easier for you? Use those people as levers to move the weight of your whole organization. We had some folks in our operations teams. I just went and talked to them one day, and they not only did they learn how this worked, they redesigned whole systems to facilitate less of a batch-oriented uh, monitoring approach and more of a, of a real-time approach. They also taught everybody else in the team. So my team didn't have to go and like, teach this team how to use these tools. They did it for us, and it was awesome, and we get to watch them grow now. Um, this is not about my success or about my team's success. This is about Stripe's success and about this change in culture. And so by doing this, we've empowered all these other people uh, to do the work for us. You could also call that delegation, I suppose, if you wanted to be, uh, if you wanted to be more crass about it. Um, lastly, in this space, I want to talk about value. 
you are doing this for a reason, right? You've chosen to switch to Datadog or to get rid of some old system. To do so, you need to be adding some type of value. We don't make change without adding some type of value, else why are we doing it? What is it you're actually trying to improve? Are you trying to improve mean time to detection? Are you trying to decrease the number of incidents? Are you trying to improve mean time to remediation? There's all kinds of cool metrics you could be improving, but A, what is it you're improving? B, how can you measure it? And then C, constantly think about whether or not this is the best way to do it. Not necessarily like, should I be switching to Datadog? You don't have to think about that every day. Some, some decisions you should live with for a little while. But is this individual approach I'm taking the best way you could be approaching this problem? Don't be afraid to shift gears if you have to. So Alexi talked about this a bit ago. The word observability gets used a lot, um, maybe just by me. I don't know. I, I feel like I see it a lot, but I think I'm just tuned to it. Um, why do we want observability, and what does it really mean? Um, it's not just a replacement for the word monitoring, and it's not just about metrics. So observability is actually a real thing. If, you, if any of you in here were electrical engineers or studied engineering, you probably at some point touched control theory. If you know a lot about control theory, please wait until later to correct me for all the things that I'm saying incorrectly about control theory. But the gist of what observability means in control theory is observability is about measuring how well internal states of a system are working by measuring the external outputs. You can't see into, say, the engine running in your car to know whether or not it's working, but you can look at the output. Like I'm sure many of you have at some point in your, in your lives been in some vehicle or something that you pressed the gas to go and the thing didn't do the thing it was supposed to, and you could tell by the external output that the system was not working the way that you expected. So we need to figure out how to replicate that type of thing in the work that we're doing every day. And so systems, like the systems that we work on, the services, the products, they output work. If the internal state of the system goes bad because the database is broken or a machine died or AWS uh, US East 1 is busted or if DNS stops working to quote current events, then if that goes bad, you need to know. And the way that we know that is by adding sensors. So this is the part where uh, anyone who's cons who studied control theory maybe should cover their ears until later. But we're going to generalize this for use with software engineering. This is a feedback loop. So we've got a reference coming in that's saying, this is a thing I want to happen. We've got, in this case, you could generalize this, this chart a lot, but we've got a programmer who is supposed to take this idea and turn it into some system. So we all write code that then is supposed to output work on the far side. Um, does this thing have a laser beam? Sweet. <laughs> this, everything just got better. Uh, later, I think I actually need it to. So we need to add sensors here such that when these sensors notice things, the programmer is notified such that they can then improve the system. This is what we do every day. Like scaling is all about sensors, feedback loops, and improving the system. This is an extremely powerful chart that you should like burn into your head and use with almost anything. I'm actually going to use it for jokes later. It's great. I love it. So now that we've talked a little bit about what observability is, I should really have like transitional slides, but I had to squeeze it down to fit today. Um, many of you may work in an organization like mine that's very flat. Stripe has no titles. Um, we are basically just a bunch of people that sort of collectively try to get work done. That can be a big challenge sometimes. How do you, uh, as a new person in an organization, now if, if you're like the director of monitoring or observability or something here and you can just like sort of waddle into things and be like, we're doing it this way, that's great. I don't have that. Um, that would be cool if people just let me be the king of the world and decide these things, but it's a challenge otherwise. So the hardest part of that, I think, is really just getting started. You have to come in every day and start plugging away at this work. So do that. Come in every day with this goal in mind. What am I going to do today to push this rock a little further along? There are a preposterous line of yaks between you and the other side of this. The only way that's going to get better is if you actually shave them. Uh, after I gave this talk at Monitorama, someone came up to me and said, you just described a Tessa yak, which is like an infinite number of dimensional yaks. And I was like, okay, I'm going to use that. Thank you. Um, the, the line of yaks is long, and you're going to have to shave them all. That's the only way to get the work done. It may not be you specifically. It may be your whole team. But the yaks must be shaved. Uh, stigmergy is something that uh, I, I found on Wikipedia at one point. You can look this up on Wikipedia and become an expert in it like I have now. Uh, the idea behind Stigmergy is how do systems that don't have orchestration get orchestrated? Like how do a group of ants know how to function as a colony when there's not really any one ant that's going around telling each other ant what to do? Stigmergy is about when one ant comes back and he's got like, you know, a big grain of 
sugar on his back, then other ants are like, whoa, that guy, that's, he's got cool stuff. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to check his chemical trail and see what he's doing and try to do those same things. It's this idea that if you demonstrate work in a group of people, other people will probably start working with you. And so if you come in every day and you keep plugging away at it, other people will show up. We call this grind or hustle sometimes. Same kind of thing. So lastly, strike when opportunities arise. So some of the worst, most stressful, scary times at a place are when something is broken. But those are also the times when you have the most leverage. Because if you can demonstrate value at a time when something is broken, you have just totally one-upped like, all of the other tools that are sitting around that you're trying to replace or what have you. And this is really good stuff. This is also good for your own, uh, for your own stock within the company or what have you. Like, this is promoting you and showing that you and or your team have the ability to, to make this work even better. So on that note, uh, engineers, I have found, are not typically all that excited about advertising their work. Um, I'm not really sure why. We tend to have a lot of hubris and think that we can do anything, yet writing up a big blog post that describes all the work that we've done is sometimes not our favorite thing. But people don't know you're doing work if you don't talk about it. You can do so without sounding like a pompous ass, and some of the best ways to do that is to promote the work of the team instead of yourself. This is not just you going out and doing this work. This is a collective team. As I mentioned earlier, I've got a team of six people that work with me on this every day, and it's only through our combined efforts that we're able to do this. More so, though, I mentioned leveraging other teams and finding power users. Promote their accomplishments. Every time I see an email at Stripe where someone says, look at this cool thing we shipped, and I see a Datadog chart in it, I know that my team helped make that possible. And that promotion is a great way to get other people, like look at, look at the success we have created in other teams. These are our use cases, these are our success stories. Also, if you see someone doing something like, say they're embarking on a cool reorg of that service that everybody knows is terrible and they're gonna, they're gonna start over again, this is a great opportunity for you to sort of sidle up beside them and say, hey, can I, can I help you with this? Can I help you instrument this? Can I help you with the code points? Can I help you set up the monitoring for this? Or something like that, and then use that as an opportunity to learn. The more you help other people around you, and the more they see you as a helper, the more you're going to learn from them, and the better your results are going to be in the future. Uh, last, we have a cute thing at observability, or in observability at Stripe. At some point, we came up with observabees as a cute pun on observability. And so we have a brand now. We actually have little emojis. We have like, I don't know, five or six different bee emojis that we slap on almost everything that we do. We use them in the signatures of emails. People call us observabees. They join our Slack channel and use a bee before they say something and put like a little wave. Um, I'm not sure where it came from, but I love it because it's just something that people can seize on in a way that they can address us. We also try to be extremely helpful. Datadog has set a great example of having awesome customer support. We try to do the same thing. How can we help the other engineers go that extra mile? When they ask us a question, we don't just answer it, we answer it and then we partner up with them to make sure that the answer that we gave worked and that we've seen it through all the way to completion. Our willingness to invest in any, like, I think when I pitch working in observability at Stripe to people, always be recruiting, um, we, uh, we always try to throw in the, the whole polyglot thing. We probably touch every code base within Stripe. We write every programming language. Um, this team has the opportunity to touch anything at Stripe, and that's awesome. Not everybody gets that possibility. Like you often get siloed and you work in like your little part of databases or, or, uh, or query parsing or whatever it is. Well, we, we try to work everywhere and we make that part of our brand. So the tools that you're gonna build for people and the stuff that you're gonna do with Datadog in your organization, uh, it's your job to make it easy and good. I like to use email as an example of not doing things good but making them easy. Uh, how many of you have received email today? You don't even have to raise your hands because I know you all did. How many of you were excited about that email that you got today? None of you were. Yet, if you received a package, like if there was a box sitting on your doorstep this morning, you were probably excited because that's an easy thing to do, but it's good. The thing that comes to you is usually something that you asked to have come to you, right? So it's very easy to write easy things, but it's very hard to write easy good things. So, uh, but I mean write, create, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, process or, or engineering work. So it's important that you make it easy or even automatic to do things right and extremely hard to do wrong. If you don't want people to build monitors that trigger constantly and wake them up in the middle of the night, you have to make it difficult for them to create those types of monitors, which may mean that you create monitors for them that follow good standards or that you lint them or enforce some kind of standards or what have you. Quality is really, really, really important for this stuff. 
It is extremely important that you do not wake people up at three in the morning unnecessarily with a bunch of trash that you've generated. And they'd be like, sorry guys, you know, I just, sorry, you know, we just, we just did that, our bad. You have to follow up on that stuff. So I'm gonna shift now into talking some more about specific things that we do with Datadog where we have tried to make some of these things that I've described to you possible. So this is the show and tell part. Um, automated monitors is our sort of like brand name for monitors that we have created uh, we use a feature of Datadog called multi-alert. So when you make a, an alert with Datadog, you're often just saying, if this threshold is crossed for this metric. But there's also a powerful feature where you can say, if this threshold is crossed for this metric, for any specific tag therein. So let's say, for example, you've got these common problems like disk space or swap space utilization on a Unix box. We can set up monitors automatically that because each host is tagged with the name of the team that owns the host, we can detect that these things happen, make the, host, uh, the host's team one of the tags that we alert on, and then downstream, we will create an alert for you automatically anytime that this happens. So we will notify you, you don't have to set it up. Because I don't have to go to every team and go, did you make that monitor to make sure that swap space doesn't get violated on your box? Because no one ever remembers to do that until three in the morning when all the swap space is gone. So we've done this for people. But we have to be very, very careful. Because we've now basically lurked an alert in that's gonna page you perhaps at three o'clock in the morning and you didn't even know it existed. You have no state on it, you didn't make it, you don't know what to do with it. It's very, very important that anything you create that notifies somebody be actionable. Because just sort of like complaining at people at three o'clock in the morning is bad. I, I must have some sort of scar tissue around three in the morning because that's what I always cite as the worst time. But I don't think anybody likes getting paged, period, much less at three in the morning. So when you show people that something is broken, even if they didn't ask you to, and you show them how they can fix it easily, they care significantly more than just saying, hey, guess what, you're out of swap space, and then running away from them. They want that help. So this is an example of a ticket that we generate automatically. We only do this type of automated monitoring for things that are not going to page you right now. We only do it for things that are perfectly fine to deal with during business hours. So uh, this is Jira. Um, the important part of this is that the reporter is Body McBotface. That's probably the best feature of all of this. Um, it seems like we all got really lazy with naming after Bodie McBoatface, and now everything is something McSomething face. Um, so over here, we've labeled every single ticket that we generate with uh, a couple of things like Datadog, and the ticket maker is the name of the thing that does it. But we've also got the name uh, or the number of the monitor. This is really important because sometimes somebody will do something that causes us to accidentally generate like 50 tickets out of nowhere. I need to be able to quickly say, all right, find every open instance of a ticket created by this monitor so that we can close it and apologize to the users. Here, we are pointing them out that if this monitor is bothering you, if this is not something you want from us, please give us feedback. I have more slides on this in a moment. We're also taking advantage of Datadog's uh, char uh, included charts to automatically show them what's going on in the ticket, which is very helpful. Uh, we do this for, I forget how many of these we have now, we have something like seven or eight, but we monitor swap space, services that are in restart loops, disk space, um, cron job failure, all kinds of things. Uh, I running out of inodes is another one. The other common thread to all these is they all have simple solutions. We know how to fix this. Like, if you've ever had a box run out of inodes, you know how to fix it. You probably forgot now, and you probably have to be reminded sometimes, but we have solutions for that too. Because we make things called investigation dashboards. When you get linked by this ticket, or when you get pinged by this ticket, we always have a link that brings you to a uh, screen board that we've made, because screen boards have to be used for this because the widgets are cooler. Uh, we can't use all of these features uh, in time boards. But here, we're giving people like, this is an automated message, we're telling them that. We're saying it was created for you by observability. If you can learn more about it, we have a whole wiki page. And also, please, if you have feedback, tell us. This is everywhere, we put this repeatedly. It's also, oh, oh, don't push that button. Um, I don't know which one it was, actually. Uh, you know, we're also telling them, repeat, we're beating them around the head and shoulders, like, please give us feedback if you've, if you've got stuff. But this one is for uh, daemon tools we use to keep services running. We detect restarts. So here, this, this service was restarting like 800 times a minute. That's probably not desirable. And so we've shown them very clearly where the problem occurred. We're giving them feedback on like, mouse over this and you will get the, because everybody knows you can mouse over the charts in Datadog and you get the ticket or the, the tags as an overlay. 
So we're basically walking them through how to use this. And then when we're done, we're actually giving them a runbook down here. This is how you solve the problem. This is curated by us. We take feedback all the time. If you think you've got a better way to solve this problem, please let us know. Uh, not, well, you could too, but I mean the users that, that get alerted. And then lastly, we, we go to the feedback section. So this is just a Google form. Like there's no, there's no cool whiz bang technology behind this. I just go and read them every couple of days. So we ask people, this is, this is a great example. Um, by Julia Evans Bork on uh, uh, Twitter, you may know her. She, uh, she filled this out because we had a service that was continually restarting and we notified her. And so we ask you like, was this helpful? Did we just give you a bunch of junk? And so she was nice enough to give us a five. She said it was great, took her a minute or two to find it, but hey, everything was right here. So we asked for suggestions on how to improve. And then lastly, since we've got you here, is there anything else we can do? Is there any other way that observability could improve? Keep being amazing. I'll take it. So this, uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, a friend of mine, Kelly, at Simple. He showed me a cool dashboard that they had built where they took every single incident and they charted like how many of them were happening and by what team or whatever. Uh, this is a dashboard that we scrape all of the data out of PagerDuty every single day and we bring it into Redshift and then we use a product called Looker, uh, which is a commercial product, to basically do BI on it. This was a dashboard built by uh, Steven, our intern in the observability team. And it specifically has the ability to choose which escalation policy things went to, uh, the date range, the urgency of it, and then whether, what the SLA was supposed to be. And we've got cool charts here that show the number of incidents by day. This is the, my favorite one, though. This is the incidents by origin. This big one here is Datadog Monitor 447391. I don't know which one that is. But 32% of all pages are coming from that one monitor. This helps engineering managers know how to address their on-call toil. Like, is this something we could improve? Is this monitor being too loud? Is this something we can make better? So this is all about value. How can we both bring down how much we're bothering you and also create more value in your team? Um, this slide is kind of small. Um, it's mostly here because I think this is a problem in the whole industry. Many, many tools that allow you to build alerts and monitors and stuff, they they let you build all these things and you can put them in and they're great, but there's very poor ownership stories. I, I don't know to whom this monitor belongs. We often have to sort of hack this in, whether it be Nagios or Datadog or what have you. Um, our organization though, especially as we're growing, when, when a company is small and there's like a hundred of you, you all kind of know each other and you know who's responsible for what and if it breaks, there are probably 70 people that know how to fix it. Uh, nowadays though, we, we can't do that anymore. We're specialized. There are people who only understand some systems of Stripe and therefore, uh, Ownership is important. You don't want to page the wrong person. And so uh, we're still worrying about how to solve this problem. Um, but I just wanted to throw it up here because not everything's rosy. Ownership is very difficult for us. So did creating a culture of observability work? I mean, obviously I'm not up here asking you to hire me, so I'm still employed, which means I think I'm doing an okay job. Uh, yes, we have totally, uh, it's very, it was very weird for me to, I gave this talk first to Stripe people and it was kind of weird. I was like, yes, it worked. No one, no one argued with me. So <laughs> I think we're doing okay. For some teams, man, it's been great. They have, we have changed some teams. Some teams are shadows of their former selves. Um, strong, strong champions and huge improvements to their confidence, because that's a big thing you get from this, is you're confident that your services are working well and that they're not crappy. Other teams, mostly the same. Not every team totally bites this. And lastly, there are some teams that are like, wait, observe, what is the observability team? Um, these are really rare, uh, but those are the ones I'm the most interested in. How can we, how can we get over and help those people? But they're, they're very rare. As far as usage goes, I've updated this slide very particularly to reflect changes since I gave this talk the first time in June. Uh, greater than 100% growth in every single measure about like the, the, uh, the nouns we've created in Datadog. So 450 dashboards, that's up 100% over June. So it was already big then, but now it's 100%. So there were 339 dashboards in Grafana, now there are 450. Uh, the notebooks feature is probably, we don't count notebooks, that's probably gonna help us because I know I have Cori testing and Cori testing two, one of which is a time board and one of which is a screen board for reasons that frustrate me. But um, I, I told all the Datadog people that I would often complain about screen boards and time boards, so this is also a joke. Um, the, uh, we also have 400 different monitors. This is awesome, like this is 400 things that are monitoring whether or not Stripe is functioning and working well. In the old one, there were, there were like less than 100. No one even trusted them. Often the way people knew that something was broken was they just watched all the time, or a customer, or we used the tried and true system of being told via Twitter that our stuff was broken. 
Um, 7,587 metrics doesn't mean much because we have a lot of tags now. So how many metrics we really have? Uh, I mean, I know we have one metric, the cardinality of which is something like 100,000 over an hour. So that one by itself is that many metrics. Um, but not really compar a comparison. Back when I gave this talk originally, I was so proud. We had 2.5% response rates to the number of automated monitor tickets we had created, and all of them were positive and the average was 4.5. I'm sorry to say that is not true anymore, but mostly because people say, this cron job that failed, I didn't put it on this box. And I'm like, yeah, but you own the box. And there's some like friction internally around who should we really be telling that that problem is happening? And that seems to be the source of the uh, less than stellar feedback we've gotten on some, but it's still not really bad. They still appreciate being told, they just wish we'd tell somebody else. I do too, I wish I, wish I didn't get paged. Um, problems, things that we're having trouble with though. I did a really poor job when I sort of designed our naming scheme, which was, I sort of trended toward really general names with a lot of tags to make it more specific. Well, that really quickly gets you into tag cardinality problems. So for those not familiar, each unique combination of tags and uh, name generates one time series kind of on the back end. And so when you say, I want to sum them, you're asking to sum a lot of potential time series under the hood. Uh, this is something that has, Datadog seems to be like technically keeping up with us because as we've Im increased it, their combination of caching and performance improvements have made it mostly okay. But some of our most core metrics, like how many API requests is Stripe having, are also the ones that we have the most desire for people to put more tags on. Therefore, we get the most cardinality. Therefore, they perform slowly. This is something that I wish I had done better in my naming. We're starting to shift now to where the service is in the name instead of as a tag, which significantly drops the cardinality. Also, some other stuff we're doing with aggregation that I'll talk about later. Uh, for an individual service owner, knowing what metrics are available to them is tricky. Like, they can go to the metric summary, uh, not the explorer. They can go to the metric summary and look for metrics. But it's very difficult to know which ones are for me. If I use a common framework at Stripe, how do I know what metrics are available to me? I want there to be like a service catalog where I know what my service is and therefore what metrics are relevant to it. We also have, we still use Splunk internally and there's still a lot of questions around should I be logging or should I be metricing? Uh, we're gonna make that worse when we suddenly add spans and traces to this whole thing soon. Um, but I have plans for that, which maybe will be a future talk. Uh, and lastly, screen boards and time boards. That's annoying to both me and our users. Uh, but lastly, uh, one of the things we have trouble with is when to use a service check, an event, or a metric, and which widgets those things are available in, and what features are available in a monitor. This is something you have to be careful with. In some cases, we almost just emit all of them, because we're not really sure which one we're going to be using. But they are very handy. So that when, I, when I say primitive features, I mean the primitives that Datadog support, service checks, events, and metrics. So things that we're trying to adjust, like where we were able to change the culture, but what are we trying to do now? Where, where can we be better? We worked very tactically for the first six months. It was like, just replace everything. And that was the measure of success. Did we replace it? Are people using Datadog and not using the other tools? We're now shifting to work on much more strategic things. Um, there was a blog post at, at Stripe on the engineering blog last week for a, uh, an open source project called Veneur, which uh, we have used to replace the dog stats D that comes with the Datadog agent. And we run our own, effectively, dog stats D in Veneur on every box. Uh, we have central boxes to which it then sends metrics and generates global percentiles and sets. Uh, this is something that was missing for us because previously with stats D, you know, you send all your metrics to one box, therefore you get a global percentile for, say, the timing of a function or an API call. We now get that, but we also get host local metrics, which is very nice. So big shout out to uh, Remy at Datadog specifically. I don't think he's here today, but uh, he was very helpful in us getting this to work because we kind of bombed Datadog with like 45 megabyte post bodies for a couple days while we were trying to figure this out. So sorry about that, ops team. Um, we also uh, have, uh, well, I'll talk about, well, there's one other thing that I, f I didn't put on the slide, which is um, we, we have an open source repository of our own checks. So there's the agent which comes with all the checks that are mainline. If you go to stripe slash Datadog dash checks, we have a whole repository full of open source checks that we've either felt were not really great for inclusion into the mainline because they were a little weird, or maybe our work's in progress or something like that. We recently finished a Splunk integration that lets you monitor like search, uh, your, your master licensing, search heads, all that other type of stuff that um, is very helpful for us. We also, I've been telling you all throughout this talk that you should have good metrics on how your stuff works. We totally don't. Uh, we managed to get by just on goodwill for a long time and, and my stunning good looks, I guess. 
but um, now we're actually having to prove, like, Datadog is a thing, and it costs us money, and are we making effective use of it, and are incidents easier to solve, and stuff like that. Uh, lastly, monitoring is still hard. It's really tricky for someone who doesn't steep themselves in Datadog every day to write a good monitor. That's not because Datadog's monitoring stuff is bad, it's because it's very powerful. And so explaining to someone when to use an average, a sum, a count, a rate, all of, at least once, um, the things like window must be full before evaluating. These are very powerful tools that are very difficult for your average user to understand, and they get frustrated very quickly, and if they create shitty monitors, they just turn them off, and that's not what we want. So, in summary, uh, start small with these changes. You're not gonna just come in and just whirlwind change everything. Uh, it's gonna take time. Uh, you're eroding something away, so be like water. Uh, seek feedback often and specifically remember where that feedback came from so that you can circle back and show them that you actually listened. Uh, you don't have to do what they say, but you do have to follow up with them. Think on your value. What is it that you are trying to provide with the tools that you're, that you're selling to these people? And then be sure and measure the success that, or hopefully the success that you're having. Be sure to measure the effectiveness of these changes and that they're actually doing what you said they would do. And lastly, enjoy making a change like this. Um, this has probably been the most fun in my 20 years uh, in this industry that I've had. Um, making this change for an organization like Stripe and working with a group of people who are so happy to, to work with us on these changes. It wasn't always easy, like sometimes it was contentious, but by and large they were accepting and happy about it and this is probably the most fun I've had. The last year and a half has been the most fun I've had in my, in my entire career. Uh, I think that's it. Um, so I wanna say thank you to uh, the observability team at Stripe. So uh, Aditya is actually here today, uh, Andreas, Joshua, Kieran, Chris, Steven, all of Stripe, uh, because everyone has been so helpful in all of this work. Um, also, a big thank you to Datadog, because we wouldn't be able to do this if they weren't here building all these awesome tools and helping us through all this work. Um, if you'd like to learn more about some of the stuff that I do, you can go to, here's where I'm advertising a bit. Uh, I'm going to keep that brand up. Uh, engage with my brand at onemogen.com. Uh, there's an observability section at the top if you only care about that, but that's all I seem to write about anymore. Um, you can see me on Twitter at, at GFAT, but be aware that I think weird Twitter is hilarious and I retweet a lot of weird stuff. Uh, lastly, my GitHub, github.com slash GFAT. Also, at slash Stripe, you can find some of the open source stuff that we do uh, for this type of work. And if you are ever interested in talking about any of this, uh, or you know, if you want to join the observability team at Stripe, I shouldn't be recruiting at Datadog's event, but I'm told I must always be recruiting. So therefore, you can always reach out to me with questions or whatever, uh, Corey at Stripe.com. And uh, lastly, the joke slide, questions to feed into my feedback loop of making this talk better. That was supposed to be funnier than it apparently is. But um, if you give me feedback, it goes to me, and then I put it into the slides, and then this talk gets better. So, questions. Uh, so how do we get to 450 checks and who helps make them? Um, some of this was stuff that was already there. Like we replaced a lot of Nagios checks. Um, Stripe's got a bunch of very experienced people that had these things in place. Um, other ones we found as opportunistic, like the, uh, the cron job failures. We, th we sent them to email lists and people ignored them. And so a much better solution was to, we, we also have rate limiting built into our ticket maker, such that if it fires a bunch, like you don't get inundated. But the majority of them originally just came from us by hand converting them over from Nagios. Then later we started to add a bunch of supplemental ones. Again, go to your incident review meetings that the organization probably has, and then what could you do to help prevent those things? A lot of them came from that. Most of them came from the collective wisdom of all the smart people around Stripe. Um, and then many of them from the observability team itself that just had a cool idea. Uh, and then the lion's share of them, though, to be clear, are the ones that teams have made for their own services. So we represent a small portion of that. In the behind you, Alan. Hey, you said that there's uh, 550 employees at Stripe. How many of them are engineers or technical or kind of like your users? I'm not allowed to tell you. They told me I couldn't give that. I don't know the number, but they told me I couldn't say that number. So 550 was what was on the press page.
I can't say percent either. I heard that. You, you, you have a team that five or six people dedicated for observability. Um, at what point in the stripe growth, um, either by um, quantity or, or some of the measure that the stripe uh, decided they need that sort of dedicated team to do that? And the second is um, um, there's a data talk, um, you know, API to, to send the custom metrics to, um, to, to, to the STAS-D and eventually show up in data talk. It's sort of, uh, you, you, you sort of have to educate the, uh, the application, you know, engineers to, to, to make correct usage of it. Uh, how, how, how does the uh, observability team, you know, uh, work with the engineer? I mean, is, is your team responsible for sort of educating the, 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 the engineers to make correct usage of it? Or, or what, what, what kind of things that, that you do that, you sure. know, if, if they want to have better visibility in the application, they, they, they should be sending that. I, I, I yep. just want to understand, you know, where, where the, the, the division of, responsibility sure. in, in, in Stripe? It's a, it's a very good question and uh, a weird answer to it. So the first question was, how does Stripe choose uh, how many people were going to be on that team? Um, I'd like to tell you that there was some sort of analysis and, and, uh, and cool math, but it was basically just that's how many people have decided they, like, they would like to be on the team. Stripe's very fluid about teams. If you're interested in joining a team, as long as you're not like leaving your other team in the lurch, uh, then it's fine to usually swap teams and join them. Originally, the observability team was just a bright, eye, a bright flash in my eye, and then I managed to find a few other people who were interested, and so we, we operated with a team of three for up until probably the second quarter, and then we've added a few people since. And so now it's we're sort of growing proportionally to the infrastructure group. Uh, we are one of the teams that I think is better is higher level staffed, but um, also because maybe I'm biased, but I just think this stuff is so cool that it's easy to recruit for it. Uh, but there's no particular reason we have necessarily seven people. But that leads me to the answer to your second question, which is we have to get people to instrument their code and to know how to make good use and effective use of these tools. The first is that we maintain the, so we don't have people use the StatsD libraries directly. We have a library called Metrics that is part of the core framework that is used within all of Stripe's products. And uh, then we also have them in other programming languages as well. But basically we create the libraries that our engineers use. So we have tailored them specifically to the use cases that our customer, that our our customers, uh, not Stripe's customers, but other engineers at Stripe, uh, what they're used to using. So in many cases, we are automatically instrumenting things for them, and they don't even know. Now, how do we educate them and make them better at it? Uh, I mean, this is both a good and a bad answer. It's bad because it doesn't scale well to have to go into every team and teach, but that's effectively what we do. One of the things that I like to do and that I, I really push within the team and that has attracted some people to the team is I like to go and uh, I, th I think most of us are familiar with SREs by now where you tend to take an SRE and embed them into another team to sort of help them with their operational function. Uh, that's what we do with observability folks. We try to get them to go work in another team for a few weeks and sort of help out with that problem. Like right now we're paired up with, with our risk team and they're improving the sort of like, they're getting rid of all their old Nagio stuff and converting it over and then instrumenting code where possible. So basically we do one-on-one -on -one partnerships with other teams to try to improve the state of the art. Um, I hope that got all the different steps. Sure, just last question. You showed the survey as one way of collecting feedback to make sure that your, your team is doing well. Um, and that you're improving. When you're, uh, what are the measures you're going to use when you're able to report on, on the success of the observability team? Uh, so the aforementioned survey is obviously helpful, but only really for automated monitoring. Stripe has a culture of, I think it's called like 360 degree feedback, where you solicit feedback from everybody around you. So the collective sort of feeling of how are these individuals doing sort of stacks up. Um, just yesterday, there was a discussion in a channel about Stripe adopting some new thing, and someone, I totally didn't bribe them, specifically mentioned that the observability team has been very successful bringing this sort of change into Stripe, so what can we learn from them on that? So sort of like tapping into like the general trimmers of the, of the company. And then lastly, for things that are more uh, quality or quantitative, um, I think that our mission is basically to reduce mean time to detection. 
So how quickly can we bring down knowing that something has occurred? I can't necessarily help you with mean time to remediation because I don't know that your service is tooled well enough to deal with the problems that have come about, but I can help you with mean time to detection. And so that's probably the best measure that I think we will have in terms of our effectiveness across the organization. And then, of course, we have a significant impact on the number of incidents and the urgent and the uh, uh, like how bad those incidents were. So we have a, like a level system internally, level one, level two, level three. When those happen, we're not directly responsible, but we can certainly help prevent them in the future. So if we're good at keeping like five nines or whatever, then hopefully that's a measure of success for us. I hope that covered all the things. Well, thank you very much, Corey. That was fantastic.